Brother, we started a spiritual journey. On the evening, if you remember, when Passover was way back on April 19th. That seems like a long ways back, doesn't it? We washed feet, we took the bread and the wine, signifying the death and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Then the Days of Unleavened Bread came right after that, and Pentecost came towards the end of the beginning of June, if you remember that. Trumpets, atonement, and finishing up with the feast and the eighth day, or the last great day of the feast. Those days are a lot more fresh in our minds, aren't they? And that whole, that whole thing is a marvelous plan that God has established, and he established it since the beginning of creation. Now the feast, especially, is an exciting time for God's people. It's tranquil, it's peaceful, it's calm, it's joyous, and it's also inspiring for all of us, for all of God's people. One in which we don't want to leave from because when we, you know, we anticipate going to the feast, you think about it for months on end before you even get there, don't you? We talk about it here in church services. Where are you going to go for the feast? Or where are you going to go? What are you going to do? All that type of stuff leading up to the feast. And then you get there, you have that spiritual high going through the feast. But what happens afterwards? What happens after the prayer on the eighth day? Anyone ever stay at, especially a resort, an all-inclusive resort? Any of you ever stayed at a place after the feast was finished? What does it feel like after the feast is finished? Does it feel the same as the previous day? It doesn't, does it? It never does. Bibi and I had the opportunity to go to Pema City Beach this year. We also had the opportunity to uh, be with her niece and nephew that came up from Guyana uh, to be with us for that time period. It was nice to be with them. But we also got to experience a wonderful feast, just as all of you did, with good food, good messages, and fellowship with the brethren. Overall, the feast is an exciting time for God's people, isn't it? I don't know, like I said, I don't know of anyone who doesn't look forward to the feast and what it signifies in God's plan. We're all looking towards the kingdom, right? That thousand year millennial period. And then what comes after that? But like I said, once those eight days are over, as it is for this year, does that excitement necessarily have to end for us? Maybe it already has for most of us. We consider that sort of a post-feast letdown that we experience from that spiritual high. But what I'd like to try and get you to think about going forward over the coming months is a way to maintain that excitement going forward. So how can we as members of the body of Christ maintain that excitement and inspiration as we move forward like I said, into the coming winter months. We've already changed the clocks back, so when I get out of work, it's already dark, right? For a lot of us, it's that way anymore. Of course, I don't mind getting up, and it's also dark, but at least it, the sun comes up earlier, but it's still dark. Which is, you know, it, it plays on the human psyche because it, you have, in, instead of having that sunshine all the time, in the summertime, where you can enjoy it, we don't have it in the wintertime. So can we actually avoid a post-feast letdown? Can we continue to try and strive to maintain that excitement? Well, I believe that we can. And I have some ways, some points that I'll go through today in my split sermon to prove that point. Three points for us to help us maintain the excitement today, brethren. The first one is to walk closely with God. To walk closely with God. If you would turn to Genesis chapter 6. Here we see a man who lived in similar times to what we live in now, today. A very corrupt and evil time. One in which God was ready to destroy. This is the story of Noah and the great flood. 
Genesis 6, I'll start reading in verse 5 and skip around a little bit. Genesis 6, 5, it says, And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Continually. We see that today, don't we? Continuing on, and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. And God was sorry that he made mankind. Skipping down to verse 10, and Noah, it says, begot three sons, or excuse me, that's, that's verse 10. Verse 11, excuse me. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. In verse 12, so God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. So we see here that Noah was walked closely with God. And we too as well, brethren, just as he did. Because if we parallel this account with our lives today, we walk in a spiritually wicked world, just as Noah did in his time. Now we know that God's not going to destroy the earth. That's why we see those rainbows in the sky as a covenant between him and mankind that he said, I will never destroy the earth again. And this is to show that I won't do so. Coincidentally, you can read about that if you're crossing the Rainbow Bridge from New York into Canada. They have this really big... Uh, concrete wall, and that's, that whole section of scripture uh, is on there. That's only in case you're actually going into Canada and you're stuck in line a long time and you can actually read what's on there, <laughs> which I apparently have. So walking with God means to what? It means to obey God, right? To seek his will and not our own. Now that can be very hard to do at times in our lives, but it's something that we need to strive to maintain. And in doing so, it helps us to maintain that excitement because one of the things that I, what, what I want to, you to take away from this message today, if anything, is that the more closely that you walk with God, walk with the brethren, and continue to build upon those relationships, the more excited you will be in doing the work of God, in, in coming to Sabbath services, in learning more about God's word. That's the point that I would like to make today. We can be a person after God's own heart. We know that King David was a man after God's own heart. It says so in, his, in the Bible. Now we know that he wasn't perfect either, and neither are we. Psalm 51 shows David's heartfelt prayer of repentance to God for his actions with Bathsheba. And as we know, David, God forgave David as he does with us today when we sin, don't, doesn't he? If we truly repent of our sins, God is the only one that can actually forgive our sins. But each of us can be seeking a walk, to walk daily with God and be a man or a woman after God's own heart. To be one who loves mercy, who walks humbly with God, as it says in Micah 6, verse 8, if you want to jot down that chapter and verse. So a few ways that we can walk more closely with God. And these are things that we've heard about continually in messages before. But they are things that we need to continue to do if we are to maintain that excitement, if we are to remain, maintain that closeness with God and our fellow brethren. And the first one is to pray daily. The first one is to pray, pray daily. And this is an absolute must, I believe, for all of us. It's a few places that I'll reference. Psalm 55, it says that David, a matter, like I said, a matter of God's own heart, we know that it says that he prayed morning, noon, and evening. Right? And in Daniel 6, even when it was against the law, even when a law was decreed that you, don't, you can only bow down to the king, Daniel took it upon himself to continue with his custom to open up the doors and get on his knees and pray to God. So spending time praying to God is vital to any Christian. Like I said, we can find in many scriptures that tell and show that we must 
be praying. But ideally, it should be on our knees. Why? Now, one thing that I believe I've uh, recalled here before is that when I'm driving to work, I can't close my eyes and pray. But I still do so when I'm driving to work every morning. That time, because I, I, I'm, I'm in the car for almost a half hour. I'd rather be talking to God. I'd rather be getting out my thoughts and just communicating with him rather than listening to the radio or doing nothing. So if you can find times like that to do those types of things, that will help maintain that excitement. That will help that communication process between you and our Heavenly Father. And that's something that we should get excited about. Because, but ideally, praying on our knees is what we should be doing because in that way, we are humbly coming before God on our knees in a more intimate type of relationship between us and our Heavenly Father. And he sees that, and he, he, that's what he wants to see from us when we're coming before him. Now, I have not perfected getting down on my knees and praying all the time in my life. Like I said, I, in the car I do so. But that's something that we all continue and should continue to strive to do in our lives is to continue to pray before God on our knees. And when we do so, you know, he knows what we need right in our own lives. But that doesn't mean that we can't still communicate with him to let him know the things that we need. And we can also be praying for others as well. And while you're praying, brethren, remember to thank God for all that we have. After all, we would be nothing if it weren't for him, would we? So give thanks to God in all of your daily prayers. You know, Mr. Herbert Armstrong said that at the end of his life, that he spent most of his time on his knees in prayer, giving thanks to God. Giving thanks to him for all that Mr. Armstrong was able to do with his life. In reading the book of Psalms, which are basically prayers, don't you notice that many of them are, in fact, prayers of thanksgiving? Notice Psalm 100, if you would like to turn there to Psalm 100. I'll read just a couple verses here. Psalm 100, starting in verse 1. It says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Jumping down to verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. It says, be thankful to him and bless his holy name. This is a psalm of thanksgiving that David was inspired to write. And that we have the opportunity to read now and to learn from. So one of the things that we can learn, brethren, is just to continue to give thanks to God for all that he does for us. We need to remember that. A second area, area number two that we can remember to do, is to maintain a good Bible reading program. Continue to read the Bible and to meditate upon what you read. Because just to read the Bible and then forget about what you read, that's, what's that going to do for you? Not much, is it? But if you set something in place where you read about it and then maybe throughout the day think about what you read, then those thoughts stick with you over time. A Bible study is very important in keeping that personal relationship with you and God going and with you and the brethren as well. And in doing so, that excitement can continue on because during the feast, what do we do? We hear messages every single day. And I think that's one of the reasons why at least I personally like going to the feast. It's to be able to go to church services on a daily basis, to hear the word of God preached all the time. Because then you continue to learn and get instructed more continuously than just on the Sabbath day. And for me, that's what I like, one of the things that I like about going to the feast. And that's 
sort of what gets me on that spiritual high. But now coming off of the feast, going back to Sabbath services, one of the things that we can continue to do is strive to pray for one another, continue to strive to maintain a, a good Bible study program, to continue that excitement. Walking more closely with God will require us to study our Bibles. Again, every day would be ideal as this, like I said, draws us more closer together with God on that personal one-on-one -on -one relationship that we and our Heavenly Father should desire. We're in the book of Psalms. Just head back to Psalm chapter 1. Psalm 1, I'm only going to read verse 2 here. It says, His delight is in the law of the Lord, and His law He meditates day and night. Day and night we should be meditating on God's law. In order to do so, you need to be reading what is in God's word, what the law is. You can just jot this down, Joshua 1, verse 8. But God commissioned Joshua to lead the people of Israel into the promised land, and he tells Joshua, he says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Why? Well, he continues on, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your ways prosperous. And then you will have good success. Don't we see that in our lives today? If we continue to remain close to God, to remain, keep that excitement going, to keep that personal one-on-one -on -one connection with God and the brethren going. We see then that we are being instructed through daily Bible study to remain close to God. And this should bring our lives fulfillment. It should bring our lives joy and prosperity. So Bible study and meditation are certainly two more areas that we can improve on if we are going to, again, walk more closely with God and keep that excitement and zeal going after the feast here into the coming months. The third area that we can look at in walking, again, on this first point of walking more closely with God is to maintain coming to Sabbath services on a regular basis. I know there are times that we can't when we're sick, when we're ill, when we're taking care of a loved one, like Sue is today. But to not come to Sabbath services because you just don't feel like it that day, is that something that you should be doing? I don't think so. As long as we are able to, and as long as we're not sick, why not attend services? Because it sure makes me feel better when I come to Sabbath services every week, doesn't it? I, think, I believe it does for all of us. In Hebrews chapter 10, if you'd like to turn to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. Starting in verse 23, it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Verse 24. And, to, and then in verse 25, it says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, to, and so much more as you see the day approaching. This is telling us, brethren, that we need to assemble. We need to gather. And we do so, as we're instructed to do, on the Sabbath day. To take this day of rest to come together, to congregate, to worship God, most and first and foremost, to sing praises to Him, and to help each other, to get more connected with each other. Because... You see events happening around the world these days. There are 
There was just a, another shooting in California, right, where two kids were killed just two, three days ago. But you've seen that all throughout the year anymore. There are shootings in schools, severe weather conditions, like all the fires out in California that are devouring hundreds of acres and hundreds of homes. The onslaught of war over in the Middle East and abroad. We can see prophecy being fulfilled before our eyes, don't we? And that should, you know, have that light bulb go off <laughs> or have that bell, bell ring, ding, 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 that something is happening in the world scene. And we need to be paying attention to that, shouldn't we? Assembling together as we do each Sabbath draws us both physically and spiritually as a group of believers. Listening and sharing to God's word does that for us, doesn't it? We come together, we listen to the messages, we talk about things in our lives, and that makes us more closely connected. And that should, then in that instance, we can maintain that excitement that we did at the feast. Because when we feast, at the feast, a, a large group of people come together, although we're small here in, in nature, but we can have that same type of, of excitement, that same type of fellowship with one another as we do at the feast. Turn back to the book of Psalms. Maybe I should have just had you hold your place there. Psalm 95. Starting in verse 1, it says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, which we already talked about. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and the, and the, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The, high, the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he has made it, and his hands form the dry land. Verse 6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, it says. And we are his people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. We are his. He formed and made us. This is a time that we can come together every single Sabbath day to congregate, to be excited about coming and worshiping him, and to assemble. Now, sometimes that's hard, isn't it? Because a lot of us, Don travels a little over two hours to get here. Every single week. Some of us, it might be shorter distances, some of us longer. But to have that commitment that desire to come to Sabbath services, no matter the distance, that's something that really shouldn't matter as long as you're able to do so. So make it a point each Saturday to make it to Sabbath services, brethren, because as we all know, it is a very rewarding to be here, to fellowship, to listen to the messages, to be inspired, to have that excitement keep growing and going. And the fourth area that I have in this first part that we do most of the time in the springtime is to continue that self-examination of yourselves. Usually, you know, we all do so in the springtime before the Passover is to examine our lives, make sure that we're weeding out any bad habits anything of those nature before we come to the Passover, as we should. But we need to continue that throughout the year. And sometimes I think, I myself included, don't necessarily maintain that excitement, that zeal to do that all the time. I said, oh, okay, I did that in the springtime, now I'll just have to redo it next spring, right? That shouldn't be the case. That shouldn't be our mindset. And we don't have to wait until the next Passover to con be continually examining ourselves to see where we can, in fact, improve 
in our lives. Examine how to be that man or that woman that follows after God's own heart. To be of that mindset and challenge ourselves, as King David did, to be a man after God's own heart. You can read through the book of Psalms like we have been and look for ways to be a person of that same heart set, so to speak, that we need to continue to desire to do in our lives. And if you can't think of anything, then ask. Ask God, as David did. Search me, O God, and see if there's anything that I need to change about my ways. He said, search me, O God, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and help me to see it. Some, maybe sometimes you just can't see it yourself. But that's something that we should be doing. We want to have that right relationship with God and to strive not to have those wicked ways form in our lives. So ask him for help or ask the brethren for help. That's what we're here for. We are a family, aren't we? Although we come from different backgrounds, although some of us were once cousins and are not anymore. <laughs> That's just a little inside joke. We are a spiritual family. And we should look at each other as family members, as brothers and sisters. Our relationship with God and the closeness of heart that he desires us to have with him and with each other can best be summed up in two words. Now these two words can only be found in three verses of the entire Bible. They were first spoken by Jesus Christ on the eve of his death when he was facing the biggest trial of his life. He knew what was to come and how awful and painful the scourging and death would be for him. But as he prayed beforehand, Jesus summed up his relationship with our Heavenly Father in these two words. Do you know what they are? Turn to the book of Mark. Mark chapter 14. This is the type of relationship we should have, especially with our Heavenly Father, but also with each other, brethren. Mark 14, starting in verse 32. It says, Then, came, then they came to a place which is named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. I would be. Wouldn't you be as well? <laughs> Verse 34. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. And he went a little further, verse 35, and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from, away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Those first two words that he says in verse 36, Abba, Father, are what I'm referring to. Now, Abba basically he just means Father. So all he's saying is Father, Father. But in those two words, sum up the relationship that Jesus Christ had with God the Father at that time. And the relationship that they had throughout time. That closeness that they have is the closeness that we should have with our Heavenly Father, with Jesus Christ, and with each other. And in doing so, that helps us to maintain that excitement that we have for God. That may, helps us to maintain that excitement that we have to want to come to services each and every week, to assemble In John chapter 1, verse 18, it says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. And this, this verse also shows the intimate relationship that God has with Christ. 
He is the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of our Heavenly Father. We can say that about our own sons and daughters, can't we? For those of us who have them. We would do anything to make sure that they are taken care of, that they are supported, that they are loved. Right? This is a very intimate expression which shows a close relationship between Jesus Christ and God, referring to Abba Father. And like I said, we should desire that same type of relationship going into this fall and winter months, and as well as all year round, brethren. If we have trials, and who doesn't, right? Who doesn't have trials, anyone? Mr. Holloway just had one this morning, coming to services. Not of his own doing, but he still had to get involved and work it out. But we can cry out to God, Abba, Father, and express that, de that desire for help, for instruction, for correction, for whatever it is. God, help me. The Apostle Paul uses the same expression later on in Romans 8 and in Galatians 4. Those are the other two places where Abba, Father is used as a cry of sonship. And that is what we are becoming, isn't it? Sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. So remember these key areas, brethren, where we can strive to grow and learn and draw closer to God in, in keeping that close relationship and walking closely with God. Now I've talked about this already, but the second point is to walk closely with each other, to walk closely with the brethren. What would it be like if you were the only person who you thought knew and kept the commandments of God? They'd get pretty lonely, wouldn't it? Elijah felt this way, like he was the only one. But God let him know that there were at least 7,000 others who did not bow down to Baal. That there were others out there. He just didn't know about them, but there were others out there. We have wonderful brothers and sisters, members in the body of Christ all around the world that we meet at the feast, yes, but also that we have here in our local congregations. Do you ever get encouragement by the fellowship that you have each Sabbath? Because I sure do. It lifts me up with much the same excited feeling that I get at the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's what we should be doing because, like I said, we are a family. Growing up on the farm, most of you know that I have three brothers and a sister. But growing up on the farm, it was mostly just my brothers and myself. And, you know, brothers, they just form this tight-knit bond. And especially when you have to work with them, day in and day out, you get a little bit closer. And as the years go by, you form that tight relationship with each other. Even if there are hundreds of miles in between you and your siblings, after you grow up and depart and go your own ways, what have you, there's still that connection that you have with one another. These things bring us together in a bond that cannot be broken can it, between you and your siblings? Because there's that closeness. And that's what God desires for us to have with our family. But doesn't he desire the same exact thing with our spiritual family as well? And maybe even more so. 1 Peter 4.8 tells us to have fervent love for one another. Fervent love for each other. Mr. Armstrong, referencing him again, once said that you can have a closer relationship with the brethren than you can have with a loved one who is not in the church. Now, that took some time for me to think about, but I can see his, I can see his point. 
because some of us do have uh, family that are not in the church. But then there can be that one or two people that you see on a constant basis on Sabbath services that you have that more intimate relationship with because you're come together in a more spiritual type of application because we are filled with God's Holy Spirit. And that draws us together in ways that just can't be so with people that don't have it, right? And God wants to, us to have that oneness, that closeness for each other. And we need to remember that, brethren. You can jot down Psalm 133, verse 1. It says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. How good and how pleasant it is to be here today. Our relationship needs to be close and warm. We are brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of the same Heavenly Father. And it pleases Him to see all of us gathered here today in unity and in peace. He looks down from His throne and says, How good and how pleasant it is. In Philippians chapter 1, if you'd like to turn there, Philippians chapter 1. Starting in verse 3, Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and in confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. But he says, I have you in my heart. That's the type of relationship that Paul had with others that maybe he never even met. But just because he knew that they wanted to have a life in which they were called out of by God and to live a, a different way, he had that closeness with them, even if he didn't know them. That's the type of closeness that we should have with each other because we know each other, don't we? We all have each other in our hearts, don't we? Whether it's through our prayers, through our meditation, through our thoughts, if someone comes up to you and says, oh, well, I've had this difficulty or this going on in my life, pray for that person. And then let them know that you, you are. Not to, so that they know, but that, so that they know that you are doing something outwardly for them. Because that lifts their spirits up as well, doesn't it? Because they're not the only one praying to God for this thing to resolve in their life. They know that others are playing for them. And that should lift us up, spiritually speaking. And that's the way, that's the relationship that we want, that we need to have with one another, brethren. Let's look at just a couple more verses on this over in the book of Colossians. Just a couple pages over in your Bible, Colossians chapter 3. Starting in verse 12, it says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So above all else, make sure that you have that love for one another. And not just now, brethren, but always. Like I said, one way that we can maintain that excitement is to maintain these levels of closeness with each other. 
The third point I have is to have your heart in the work of God. What would it be like, ask yourself, what would it be like if you had nothing to do ever? Sometimes I go to work and some days are less busy than other days. And on the days that are less busy, it seems like I'm looking at the clock or I'm looking at my watch all the time. And it's like all oh, only 10 minutes have gone by. But if you're doing constant work throughout the entire day, it seems to like fly by, doesn't it? Idleness is boring. Staying busy keeps our mind sharp and having some type of work to do keeps us active. It's the same thing with God's work, with the work that he has us doing in preaching the gospel and preparing a people. That's not just headquarters, is it? Collectively, we need to be doing things. Individually, we need to be doing things to have our heart in the work of God. Turn to Matthew chapter 28. Very popular verses of Scripture, memory verses for a lot of us. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. At the end of Matthew's account here, it sa he says, quoting Jesus Christ, says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's our commission. That's our job. That just wasn't what he was telling his disciples to do. That's what he's telling the church to do, always. In the Olivet Prophecy, Jesus Christ is quoted as saying, This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Notice that it says we are to be witnesses, and we know that we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to be out there preaching on the street corners, as we see some. But when we have the opportunity, we're supposed to be that light. We're supposed to be that witness to others. And you can especially do so with people that you come in contact with on a regular basis, like your coworkers. They see that you're a different type of person. And it may not just be because you go on this crazy religious eight-day festival, right? Or you observe these old rituals from the Old Testament. But yes, they do also see those things. And that sets us apart from others. That's what God wants to see. But he also wants us to see that we're actively doing the work that he and Jesus Christ established for us to be doing. You know, first came the radio program of Mr. Armstrong, and that was a way to get the word out to a large group of people. But since the invention of computers and the internet, we're able now to preach the gospel into all the world. We have the Beyond Today program that's preached all around the world. So the times are coming when we are able to preach the gospel into all the world. Now, there are some areas that we could still try and get into. And I'm sure the church is trying very hard to do so. But we need to continue to be doing the work of God. And there are two ways to be doing that. And I mentioned that collectively as a whole church group and then individually. Now, collectively, you, can't, you think you may not be able to do much, right? Because everything's done at the home office. The Beyond Today program, the magazines, and everything else. So what could you be doing to help the home office? You can pray for them. You can pray for the people. You can pray for the people that are being instructed by God on what to talk about in these programs, what to talk about in the articles, right? Tell... Tell God, 
to help them to be inspired to write things that are pertinent to this day and age. Prayer is a very powerful tool. And then individually, brethren, we can be witnesses, like I said, to those that we come in contact with, those that we meet. We're in the book of Matthew, so just turn to chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. He says, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Now that's not physically talking about an actual lamp. Metaphorically, that's speaking about our actions. That's speaking about what we're doing individual as individuals in proclaiming the gospel to the world through our actions, through our conduct, through our speech to others, not necessarily of like mind and faith. Our lives are witnesses to others, to our family, our husbands, our wives, children, etc. And like I said, they, our lives are witnesses to our friends, our co-workers, your boss, your neighbors. So remember those things. Because sometimes I forget. You know, I'll slip up and say something that I shouldn't have. And then later on when I'm praying to God, I'll say, please forgive me for what I've done. But that doesn't mean that I stop. That doesn't mean that I'll just give up because it's easier to do that than continue on. We have to continue on. That's the thing that God wants us to do. We're supposed to have that fervent desire to move forward, to have that excitement. Turn to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55. Last place I will turn to today in this message. Isaiah chapter 55, starting in verse 10. It says, For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to all the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. And it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. That verse 11 there says a lot, doesn't it? About what the church is doing collectively in preaching the word. And what we need to be doing individually in preaching the word. Because he says that it will not come back void. You witnessing to others, knowing that they think you're different. Someday they'll know why. They'll see. Their eyes will be opened. And then they'll understand. So all that we do in preaching the word is for nothing. It's not for nothing, excuse me. And it won't be in vain. Some may think that the church is too small of a group to really do anything. The church of God. Against the billions of people that are out there. The billions of people that know nothing about Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. Maybe we are a small group. But that doesn't mean that we don't put forth the effort. That doesn't mean that we just sit idly by and wait for someone else to pick up the slack and move forward with it. We, collectively and individually, as brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, need to be preaching the word. And that's just another way that we can maintain the excitement in ourselves and as a church body. So let's not get discouraged, brethren, but rather encouraged for what the future holds in store for the church. Like I said, there are many areas and avenues that we could explore in the future. Many things that can be accomplished. Look, 
ahead. So another fall festival season has come and gone for another year, but that excitement that we felt at the feast, that doesn't have to end for any of us. In the coming months ahead, remember to continue your walk with God, point number one, to grow in that relationship with him and to grow in that relationship with each other and walking more closely with the brethren, point number two, continue to keep each other in our hearts and in our, in our minds to pray for one another and continue to have our hearts in the work of God. Point number three, there's no need to feel a post-feast letdown if, that little two-letter two word, if we don't want to. But that choice is up to you and I. We can either choose to maintain that excitement or we can choose to just Go with the flow, so to speak. But like I said, brethren, the choice is up to each one of us.